Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a nice lunch. Um, I was telling, this is actually a continuation of the executive session, only that there are more people here. But I was telling um, those who attended the executive session that before coming to Zurich, I was in Boston for a month because I was invited by the Harvard Kennedy School to be among the five Hauser, Hauser Fellows. And while I was there, I was expected to talk a lot about democracy in Asia. So at the start of the session, we were talking about what's happening in Myanmar. We we're talking about what's happening in Thailand, um, in, in Indonesia, in Cambodia, many other parts of Asia, uh, where democracy is, is um, being challenged right now. But among the many questions being asked of me is, What's happening in the Philippines? Um, what happened during the elections? Why, why has the pendulum swung to the other side? And they were referring to the fact that um, as far as the Philippine political history is concerned, we were coming from one side of the pendulum into another. Um, I was telling the others at the executive session, and I think this is important to understand why the Filipinos were very vulnerable as far as this information is concerned. It's because there has been a lot of frustrations uh, about the democratic processes that have been happening in the Philippines for so long. Uh, the Philippines was, was colonized for many years, um, almost 400 years by Spain, about 40 years by America, um, an even shorter pe period by Japan, but we were able to gain our independence in um, 1945, um, our, our complete independence in 1945. And you know, we, we observed all the democratic processes and we had one president after another. Our, our democracy was patterned after the US. So um, we, were, we were having the time of our lives, being independent. But you know, the frustrations were brewing in the sense that um, during our colonial history, political power was actually entrenched in the well of the well-connected. They were the most powerful. And even after we gained our democracy, the ne democratic leaders and the democratic institutions were not able to diffuse power from the well of, such that even now, political power is still lodged in the well of and the well-connected. Um, if you look at Philippine Philippine politics. It's very, very usual that you have uh, political dynasties. Um, I was also telling the group that when I was a member of the House of Representatives before I became vice president, among the almost 300 members of the House of Representatives, there were only 34 of us who did not belong to well-entrenched political, political families. So the frustrations were brewing. People felt that despite the democratic um, improvements and advances in our processes, they never felt the benefits that should have come with it. And now that it is the age of disinformation, those frustrations were weaponized. But the, the ironic thing about it is that it is still the well-off who weaponized. It is still the political elite who weaponized those frustrations with the use of social media Social media was the vehicle, and I was so surprised during the breaks that there are a number here from other countries who are also going through the same. Um, this information has been a very, very big threat to our democracy. Um, we felt it all the more during the 2022 elections, but as I was telling the executive, um, se the, the people at the executive session again, we saw it already starting even before the 2016 elections when I was elected vice president. And then you ask again, why were we very vulnerable? Because people capitalized on our frustrations. Um, I did a, an extensive course, an intensive course in Harvard. Um, it was a three-week course, two, three sessions in all, two hours each. And I will try to, I only have 15 minutes. I will try to compress the six hours into the 10 minutes that's left. But um, just to show you how, how it was rolled out in the Philippines, social media works on algorithms. And in the Philippines, we in the opposition did not respond 
in the manner that we should have as, as speedily as we could have. When we were seeing this information already, we tried to sweep them under the rug, saying that, oh, they're not true anyway, let's not dignify them, and we were so wrong. Because when we did not give people the alternative, people, um, people uh, bought into the narrative that was being sold to them, and when we tried um, responding already, we were too late. We tried responding. Fake news was, was starting in 2015, 2016. We started responding only late 2018, early 2019. There were a lot of anti-disinformation groups already in the Philippines trying to respond. And then all the fact-checking were only relegated into our own echo chambers. We were not able to penetrate the fortresses that they were, made, they, they were able to make. And I am telling you this. Because people I have talked to earlier during the break were saying it's happening already even in Europe. It's not just happening in Asia. Um, you know, um, maybe, maybe we started, it started earlier in the Philippines, but just to give you a, a, a bird's eye view of how difficult it is once it's there already. Um, there's no playbook yet. We're in the process of trying to understand how to, how to fight it. But it has threatened uh, our democracy in ways that we could never have imag imagined it would. Uh, it has trampled our elect electoral processes. Um, it has trampled the way people, people um, feel about things. Uh, when we were looking at the results of the elections, students who had the option, who had, who had access to more information, were the least likely to uh, buy into the narrative of the fake news peddlers. People who had access to a lot of information, people who would have, who would have, the, who would have um, at their doorstep, um, you know, um, options, they would have a better chance at deciding which is true and which is not. And it's the most difficult thing in the sense that um, if people's minds are so made up, public officials become less accountable already. There is no scrutiny of public officials anymore. Um, not just in the Philippines, but in many other parts of the world where disinformation is so great. Um, you know, it, it has become a veritable breeding ground of autocrats or would-be autocrats. As we have been discussing during the break, um, we are in several levels, different levels of this information already. In the Philippines, we've felt its effects because of the elections, but we are still in the middle of it all. And we are afraid. We are afraid because we don't know how to react. What we have now are best practices. One of the, one of the things that um, we're looking at is, is how Taiwan did it during the pandemic. You know, Taiwan um, acted through its Ministry of Information. Every time there's fake news that's being, uh, being said, Taiwan would do a fast, fun, and fair response. Meaning to say, before, the, before, before this information becomes the norm, uh, it's the Ministry of Information who corrects um, immediately the disinformation. And you know, the difficult thing about it is if this information is state-sponsored, then it will be more difficult. Um, in the Philippines, one of the most difficult things that happened is that there is no net neutrality. When I say that there is no net neutrality, some of the social media sites are being offered by the telco companies for free, like Facebook, YouTube, TikTok. You know, for, for telco companies to, to offer it, it as a come on, for their subscribers, they offer the social media platforms for free. But what is the effect? The effect is that because they are so accessible already, it becomes their only source of information. So, so legitimate media, uh, for all its faults, would have been the better source of news still because they are subjected to accountability. But you know, in Facebook, People can post on anonymity. 
and there is no accountability at all. But in the Philippines, it's a main source of information already because it's free. It's available on free data. India. India did not allow it to be, a, to be available on free data. There's been a lot of debate on this because, you know, um, India was able to regulate because um, everything is not free. Everything is not free, so um, the accessibility to, to these sites, spewing this information, is not, is not as great as in the Philippines. There's also a debate about this because uh, the debate is that it can be used by the powers that be also. Um, we, we are looking at many best practices in the Philippines, as I've said earlier during the, the early part of, of the discussion this morning. I was saying that despite our experiences, I still feel that we can reverse the tide. I can still feel that technology can be used for the good as long as we know how to use it. Um, we saw some bright spots, especially during the campaign. Um, during the campaign, because people were so aware that this information was working already in the Philippines, people just, just um, organically fought um, peddlers of this information. It was not, we, didn't not, we did not have enough time, but people came in droves. Um, they, they were organically fighting this information. And we were able to start a momentum that we feel is worth building on. There are some bright spots I, 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 I mentioned earlier about Iran. I am sure you have been reading about uh, what's happening in Iran now. We see what happened in, we saw how, what happened in Brazil. Uh, Brazil was also a, a breeding ground of a lot of disinformation, but um, we saw what happened when civil society and the grassroots organizations took it upon themselves to band together. So the, the, the main idea as far as fighting this information is concerned is those of us who are here, here um, fighting this information, we should all band together. Uh, even if we don't know how to fight it off yet, even if th there are a lot of suggestions already, there are, not enough, there are not enough literature out there because it's happening as I speak. But if we band together and share best practices, then perhaps we could be able to achieve some things. Um, you know, as far as the other democracies in Southeast Asia is concerned, um, Tom was saying earlier that 2024 is, a, is an important year. 2027 is, an, is a more important year. But 2023, 2024, we would see many elections in Southeast Asia. There will be elections in Thailand. There will be elections in Indonesia. There is a coming elections in, in Cambodia or Myanmar. Um, and it's worth, it's worth looking at because the elections will decide where the trajectory will be again. Um, there's a lot of many different groups trying to band together now. I was, I was telling the group earlier that I don't know if you've heard about Maria Ressa, our 2021 Nobel Peace Prize winner, who's a Filipino, a Filipino journalist. Um, she's done extensive work on this information already, um, and she's be been doing a lot of, uh, of work still, trying to lobby for um, legislation to be passed, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world. Uh, legislation to be passed trying to, to make social media platforms accountable because they have not been self-regulating enough. And, and, you know, there's a lot of promise out there as long as um, we are all in this together. So wh while the prospects are bleak, um, there is much to hope for. Um, during the campaign, uh, our rallies would have millions of people clad in pink because that was our political color. And even if we lost the elections, there is a lot of hope that people are actually willing to fight the good fight. Um, against, against many of the forces that are threatening our democracy. So thank you very much. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. Can, can I, yeah. Thank you so much, Lenny. Um, and, and I love how much you said in these 15 minutes and that you ended on a hopeful <laughs> note. Um, that, is, uh, that is very nice to hear. Um, I do just want to, we have maybe time for, for one question. And 
what I found is interesting is sort of one, if I had to like write a slogan based on your speech, it's like, you know, the news is fake, but the frustration is real. And I think that's an important <laughs> insight that, you know, this is only if there's widespread yes. frustration, it's kind of like the ground yeah. on which the yes. fake news and the disinformation. And, and, and you know, Nico, grow. if if there is one lesson that um, we learn, it's really that, you know, the animating spirit of democracy is inclusivity. Hmm. Um, we, we see that the frustrations are coming from the fact that inequality is so great. It, it is so much greater now than it was before. And, um, you know, inequality breeds frustration, and frustration makes you vulnerable. It makes societies vulnerable. So really, uh, democracy should bear in mind that the animating spirit should really be to make sure that the last, the least, and the lost do not get left behind. But I also found remarkable is what you said about net neutrality. Um, and it kind of harks back, of course, to this morning where we talked about governments regulating technology. So let me ask you this. It, this seems an obvious thing to do for countries, right? to, to ensure that there's not certain sources of information online that are yes. easier accessible yes. uh, for, through pricing or, or, yes. or other means. Why hasn't it happened in the Philippines? Like, What would need to change in the Philippines for it to happen? You know, we have not passed any legislation that... Uh, would address where we are now as far as, led, as far as this information is concerned. There are not even enough bills that are being discussed now. Um, I know for a fact that there's one in the Senate where um, there is an attempt to go after the influencers. There, there's se se several levels um, in the disinformation structure. The, the lowest ones are the um, fake news peddlers. But there, there's a lot. There are influencers and there's PR consultants. Uh, but there's not, there's not enough debate yet. It's like um, it was a wait and see for so many of us. And because perhaps um, because of the people um, behind them, there's, there's not much effort that's there uh, to combat it. You said at the very end that you were hopeful, so let's remain hopeful. Um, <laughs> thank you very, very much for being here and, and for your insights. And of course, we'll continue the conversation thank later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you. And now, again, it's my pleasure to welcome back Tomohiko Taniguchi um, first and then Raja Mohan for two very short responses and uh, expansions on the topic of democracy in Asia. Tomohiko, please. It takes, uh, it takes for humans to mature. It takes uh, 20 years for humans to simply mature. What about democracy? Democracy is a curious animal, isn't it? It takes not only decades, but generations to mature. Because democracy is not only about free elections, which are definitely important, but more about reliable, sustainable institutions. What if you had the police force that works only on behalf of the government? What if you had bureaucracy that is deeply corrupt? There is no soil on which you could grow democracy. So, the challenge here is not to have free elections. Rather, how could we foster institutions that would be sustainable and that would help build healthy democratic culture? With that in mind, Let's take, an example for Cam Let's take uh, an example of Cambodia. The country had no civil code, no civil procedure code until 1995. And it was actually Japanese uh, aid organization with the Ministry of Justice that went into Cambodia to build from scratch those two laws. And uh, 
Tokyo's policy, if I may say, has been to foster those institutions. That is the reason why uh, there have been thousands of alumni within the uh, bureaucracy from Central Asia to Asian nations that have gone through intensive training in Tokyo. At each point in time, you have 2,000s uh, middle-ranking career bureaucrats from Central Asia, Myanmar, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, studying in Japan. You could say how much uh, outcome uh, it has created. Well, not much because of the gravitational pull that China uh, has against countries such as, vis-a-vis -vis countries such as Cambodia. But nonetheless, it is uh, uh, an effort worth um, uh, doing. Now, in terms of Myanmar, Burma, that's been very much a disappointment because until uh, two years ago, uh, the Japanese government and Burmese, Myanmar's government, jointly worked to write school textbooks from, once again, scratch, from Myanmar language, mathematics, science, art, and uh, physical exercise. Those textbooks, all of them, from elementary school to junior, were being written jointly by Japan and Myanmar. No other nation in the world, I think, has done anything like this with a foreign government, but to no avail. But we shouldn't be disappointed, because time will come once again for these sorts of things to be done again. Uh, the point that I was trying to make is that democracy is not only about free elections. Uh, democracy un not sustained by institutions that are reliable is a flower in the sand. Uh, and democracy is very much a delicate flower. And it takes generations to mature. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm not going to introduce Raja Mohan again. Um, please. I think I'll follow from where uh, Thomas Huco left, uh, that democracy takes a long time to build. So therefore, I mean, I would caution much of Europe and North America to the impatience, this idea that you can fix the democratic deficit in, in Asia, that it is within your power that the West can use its economic power, military coercion, sanctions, to force the way societies in Asia are going to organize themselves. In short, play God. Uh, what we've learned in the last 30 years is that you can't play God. That uh, your capacity to actually force the change is constrained by two factors. One, you have economic interests, that is, your only business, I mean, you're not Christian missionaries saying, look, my only job is to preach uh, democracy. But you have to do business with China, you have to do business with Burma sometimes. So the competing, and then there are strategic interests. Some of you are strategic partners, some of them are not. Therefore, the constant tension between wanting to do good, of wanting to promote democracy, to one of actually pursuing uh, your own interests, uh, produces interesting contradictions on the ground. That is, uh, let's do more business with China that will produce a middle class that will produce democracy. But let's sanction Burma because that's the only way to punish them to move towards democracy. So you have actually, given your level of interest, you're willing to take positions that are fundamentally different. Or the way you treat the Burmese dictatorship, military dictatorship, is different from the way you treat Pakistani military dictatorship because there are your friends and there are your adversaries. So, so so the problem, therefore, is this notion that you can fix the problem from outside. 
Uh, I think we passed that peak, notwithstanding Biden administration's rhetoric, uh, at least they've taken a more humbler tone. A post-1991 idea that the West can actually control or promote internal change in the rest of the world, that idea, I think, we passed the peak because I doubt if there is enough uh, either consistency uh, or of material capability to sus pursue a policy on a sustained basis. So it will be all the time, you know, half half-hearted moves, uh, sometimes forward, sometimes backward. And, and I think that, so this is not going to uh, go very far. The second, I think that doesn't mean we have no stake in democracy, but this is a battle we have to fight. That is, unless the Asian societies fight in each of the countries, each has a complex historical evolution, we have to do that battle. I mean, democracy can't be a foreigner's gift. You can't produce democracies by, by outside intervention. We've tried that in the last 30 years, many places. So it has to be an internal struggle. I mean, you can say, we'll set an example. We will say, look, we'll be nicer to democracies. But in Cold War, our experience was the opposite, where India was the only democracy that was not with the West. Well, uh, communist China and military Pakistan were much closer to the West. I mean, that's, that was the strategy. I'm not blaming. I'm just telling you the conditions under which. So therefore, I think... We, you have to let, I mean, taking on Tomahiko's point, you have to let these societies evolve on their own. That is, if you go to Sudan and say LGBTQ rights are the fundamental interests, we will tell you what to do on that. Now, you know, from a first principles of enlightenment, you can say, look, this is correct. But in a society that's not ready to accept them, uh, you know, is that, is that wise? Uh, you are actually capable of forcing that change. I take another case, population control. The Biden had, Democrats have one policy of promoting population control on the abortion debate in the US. And the Republicans come and gut the entire programs to support abortion rights in the developing world. So we are supposed to be at the mercy of the dominant power, which changes its domestic attitudes, and that everyone else is supposed to adapt one more time uh, to what is the dominant uh, mood uh, or the current political a trend in the U.S. So I think you've got to let the societies evolve, support them, those who are trying to build democracies, rather than saying, here I'm, I'm the arbiter, I'm the judge. Uh, especially given the past relationship of the West to non-Western societies, you have to be extra careful not to be seen as imposing that agenda. After all, the Dutch were preaching imperialism with a human face as late as the late 1940s. Uh, so this notion that Europe today has discovered a virtue, you're going to tell us how to do it, has not much credibility here. So that doesn't mean uh, we're going to simply blame the West and, and we won't do anything ourselves. So I think you've got to leave that battle to us, to each of our societies. We have to fight for those rights because without that internal battle, uh, this is not going to go very far. And the question is, how do you help those who are fighting for democracy, uh, for pluralism, for liberalization within these societies, the ways of helping rather than uh, through mere instruments of sanctions and other kind of coercive instruments that you have. I think I've passed my time.